Hi, this is Dr. Joby. Today we're going to be discussing Gestalt psychology, and in particular, Kurt Levine's field theory of personality. So in this discussion of Levine's field theory of personality, I'm going to assume that um, you have a basic understanding of uh, Gestalt psychology. Um, if you don't, uh, I would go back and listen to the lectures that I uh, did on Gestalt psychology that follow its development from Max Wertheimer up until uh, Rudolf Arnheim in the um, more recent history. Um, so there are going to be some things, some principles, some ideas that we will use in our discussion of Levine that you'll have to have learned from those previous lectures. Another great resource that you might want to look into is Mary Henley's text, 1879 and all that. Uh, Henley was a professor of history of psychology at the New School for Social Research, and that's actually where Max Wertheimer uh, taught after he left Germany. And that psychology department was strongly based on Gestalt psychology. And her essays give a lot of uh, insight and nuanced insight into uh, what Gestaltists' role, what their role was in the history of psychology and what their influence has been. In our study of personality, um, we've seen a, a real cross over and intersection between two major fields of psychology, that is clinical counseling, psychotherapeutic psychology, and academic research psychology. And when we discuss academic psychology, we are referring to research psychology, psychology that's done in labs in a university department or in a private uh, organization or private institution. And um, this is uh, a, a scholarly uh, a pursuit that's uh, largely, the character is largely influenced by the whole academic culture. Uh, psychotherapy, clinical psychology, counseling psychology, of course, this is um, does have its presence in, in academic institutions, especially in graduate programs where people have professional uh, studies in counseling and in uh, psychopathology and clinical psychology. Um, but uh, they're very different. They're, they're often, they're, they're always housed in different, completely different departments. So a clinical psychology or a counseling psychology program in graduate school would be an entirely different department than an academic research uh, psychology department. And in our theories of personality class, we've seen um, studies and personality that have largely been in that clinical area, clinical psychology. Um, Gestalt psychology, you may hear, um, has... Uh, a presence or had a presence, a predominant presence in research psychology, and it was uh, mostly um, focused in, at least in the English work, the, the non-German work, it was mostly focused on visual uh, processing, on, on visual perception, but it wasn't limited to visual perception. It turns out that there is uh, a lot of research that goes far beyond just visual uh, perception into the other senses. Gestalt psychology makes a distinction between sensation and perception. Uh, sensation is the thing that happens to, at the sense organs, and perception is what happens in the mind. It's how the mind organizes that material into some kind of meaningful whole. And there's the, the, the uh, catch word gestalt, uh, a construction or an organization into a meaningful whole is the gestalt and uh, when you use that word gestalt, that's what it means. It, it means you can take the same basic elements and re rearrange them in different organized ways, and you'll get different meanings. You'll, have, you'll get different uh, materials, different um, outcomes. And um, so in this understanding of gestalt psychology and the research, academic research departments as distinct from uh, counseling and therapy, now, there is a Gestalt therapy by a fellow named Fritz Perls, and it's a very effective, very useful, and very interesting theory uh, and practice. And although um, Fritz Perls claimed that it was influenced by academic Gestalt psychology, 
uh, in my study and also in Henley's uh, essay in her book 1879 and all that, she points out that uh, there really is little convergence between Gestalt, Fritz Perl's Gestalt psychotherapy and Wertheimer, Kola, and Kafka's Gestalt uh, perceptual psychology. Academic psychology has always, from the beginning, from the time of Wundt and William James in America, Wilhelm Wundt in Germany, from the, the first development of academic departments of psychology uh, has been interested in modeling itself as a natural science. Um, it began as a pursuit in philosophy and theology, uh, religion studies and, ph and philosophical studies, and uh, then became, as it was influenced by the physiologists, by biological oriented individuals who were interested in studying the sense organs, um, it became the, the model for uh, psychology, be, it became popularly the natural science model. Uh, the queen of all sciences is physics. And at this time, there was a, a, strong, a strong push towards modeling this new science of psychology, this, uh, this natural science version of psychology, modeling it on physics. And the Gestalt psychologists were the primary uh, adopters of this of this um, this idea of uh, a psychology modeled on physics. It's not uncommon to uh, understand the influence of magnetic theory of the late nineteenth century into the early twentieth century. Uh, magnetic theory and uh, the idea of force fields and electromagnetism and uh, the work eventually of people uh, in relativity theory like uh, Albert Einstein and uh, uh, Max Wertheimer, Kurt Ko uh, Kafka, and Wolfgang Kohler were all strongly influenced by uh, the work of Faraday and Maxwell and Hertz and Einstein uh, Max Planck, uh, Ernst Mach, uh, of, of many of these uh, physicists of the time who were dealing in relativity theory and quantum mechanics, and before that, electromagnetism and magnetism, uh, they strongly influenced how the Gestalt theorists went about their work. The very idea of a field theory. What this means is like a force field. If you remember in high school physics class, you would take a, a magnet and sprinkle iron fillings over a piece of paper and then put the magnet underneath the paper and you would be able to see a pattern, an elaborate pattern of, of invisible electromagnetic waves that revealed themselves with the iron filings. Um, this is the field. Uh, this is the force field, the field that... Uh, Levine used to model his theory of personality. So when we talk about a field theory, we're, we're talking about a theory that comes directly from physics and um, the idea of a field of influence uh, and interaction, a dynamic field that the personality is not something you study in a molecular way. You don't break it down into uh, molecules and study a, a small little segment of personality, sort of like in trait theory. That's not what, uh, this is not a, a molecular psychology. This is called a molar psychology or a holism in psychology. And this is the idea that personality is not something that exists specifically within an individual, but it's something that manifests in a dynamic way within a field, a field of the environment and the uh, the individual's outer and inner world. So we have a very dynamic structure. And that's why we are influenced in our personality uh, not only by things in the environment, but our interpretation and perception of those things, as well as our memories and fantasies. And this all creates a dynamic, ever-changing, ever-fluctuating uh, field theory of personality. As we will come to see, it's also very useful to think of biology um, when considering uh, Levine's 
theory of the topography or the structure of personality. And when I say biology, I'm not talking about genetic, heredity, uh, evolutionary psychology, and I'm not talking about neurotransmitters and hormones. Uh, what I'm talking about and what Gestaltists are talking about in biology is using the structure of a cell as a model of our understanding how psychological and emotional systems work. So in other words, if we take the cell, the basic cell with its cell wall and its nucleus uh, and its gates, its opening and closing, its permeability of the cell wall, all of these things as a model for understanding how personality structure works. This isn't biological, biological psychology like we think of it as in terms of the nervous system, the endocrine system, the genetic system. This is using um, the, the microcosmos, this small aspect of, of basic existence to explain bigger things. So we're going to use the cell, Levine uses the cell, as we'll see, to illustrate the structure of the field theory of the dynamic personality. And one other point I'd like to make is when I'm using this term dynamic, I'm not using it to refer to psychoanalytic or psychodynamic uh, psychology, Freudian uh, psychology. Um, I'm using dynamic in the way that Freud used it, uh, but also in the way Gestaltists are using it to understand that there's a dynamism, an active interactive dynamic that exists between environment, individual, memory, fantasy, sensation, perception, all of these things taken together. So that's what we mean. We're, we're using the word dynamic to, to say that it's overdetermined. There are a lot of factors involved that interact and organize themselves in very different ways. A side note for those of you who are interested uh, is that Gestalt psychology is often uh, discussed as being uh, a challenge to, um, to Wilhelm Wundt's uh, psychology at the University of Leipzig. This, uh, Gestalt psychology in the history was, uh, was strongly influenced by uh, uh, the, the Würzburg School of Kulpa. And um, this psychology department uh, found that um, Wundt's molecular, kind of breaking things up into little component psychology uh, was useless and that things had to move towards this holism, towards this, this gestalt psychology, big picture psychology. Well, the fascinating thing is uh, that Wundt actually arrived at the same conclusion. His final work called Volker Psychology or Social Psychology is uh, mostly uh, what we would call today social gestalt psychology. And um, this is very fascinating to consider. It's also fascinating to consider that Gestalt psychology is the foundation of social psychology. And remember, in social psychology, we study how context determines behavior, personality. And the classic study in social psychology, and some say the study that kicked off the founding of social psychology, was done by Kurt Levine. And Kurt Levine uh, in the 1940s was studying the effect of different uh, leadership styles on how children uh, interacted. And um, in that study, which um, you can view the, uh, the video footage of it, uh, looking up the Levine uh, leadership study, um, he had three leaders, three teachers, teach three separate groups of boys one was a very authoritarian, strict, rule-bound leader who gave orders uh, and watched over with a very careful eye, very punitive type of individual. Uh, we call him like the school marm. Uh, the second was a laissez-faire approach. This is the teacher who just told the kids to do whatever they want and showed little interest in anything they were doing, uh, gave them no structure, sat back and read the newspaper while they went about doing whatever they do. And finally, uh, what was called the democratic approach. And this is where the teacher got involved and had the kids vote on what they were going to do and how they were going to do it and who was going to do what, et cetera. Well, what, uh, the findings of the state were quite fascinating. Uh, the, the group that turns out that got the least done but had the most fun were the laissez-faire. 
they got very little done, but uh, they 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 enjoyed their uh, their chaos. <laughs> the democratic style um, got a good product done and enjoyed the process, and the uh, dictatorial or authoritarian style, incidentally, they had the best product, but they had the least um, enjoyable time doing it. And they were uh, there were some very interesting findings with that study that have been discussed. That's Kurt Levine. That's the guy we're talking about, and he's showing how an individual's personality is strongly determined, or strongly influenced. I might say determined might, might be a, a word that uh, suggests a little more than it should. It's strongly influenced by context. The child's experience and behavior is not only determined by something within themselves, some kind of nuclear nucleus of their core personality, but it is interdependent with whatever is going on in the, in the ecology that they're living in, in the environment they're living in, in the field. And this is just a great example that uh, one individual in three separate groups becomes three in those three separate conditions, authoritarian, laissez-faire, and democratic, the same individual becomes very different people. Levine was uh, never uh, a colleague or student of Kafka or Wertheimer or Kohler, but um, he came under their influence. And he, uh, he, was a student of someone that all of them had in common, and that was Karl Stumpf. And uh, although we're not going to go into Stumpf right now, on Karl Stumpf's influence at the University of Berlin on all three and all of the Gestaltists was as important as Franz Brentano's uh, influence on the field. After uh, the war, after World War I, uh, Levine returned to the University of Berlin, and he worked as a research assistant with um, with Wertheimer and Kohler, and so he was very much influenced. He 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 was very much influenced by the Gestalt psychologists, even though he wasn't one of uh, the founding members of Gestalt psychology. Levine came to the United States and was. Uh, a visiting professor at Stanford University when Hitler came into power. And at this point, he um, he returned to Germany, settled his business, closed up all his German business, and came back to the United States for good uh, to avoid the Nazi presence and, and what was to come. So he avoided uh, all of the, the, the things that happened in the Holocaust and the Nazi uh, invasion of, of Europe. Um, while he was in the United States, he first worked as a professor at Cornell University and then the State University of Iowa, and he did most of it, also MIT uh, and uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he did most of his uh, most well-known research in the community interrelations of the American Jewish Congress, and that was a, a, a private institution that uh, worked on studying community issues and his leadership styles. It, it was one of those community issues. Let's turn now to the field theory of personality and discuss it. And uh, I think one of the, the the ironies of listening to this audio lecture that I'm creating for you is that Gestalt psychology is uh, very much a visual psychology. Some of the books uh, that are popular have titles called Visual Thinking. Uh, most of the Gestalt examples that we see today are, uh, are, are visual, visual illusions, visual illustrations. And Kurt Levine was a very visual thinker. You really can't uh, do uh, Levine's personality theory without drawing models, drawing graphical models. And so um, I'm going to ask you to uh, draw some things while we are uh, doing this audio lecture. If we were in the classroom, you'd be watching me draw these on the board. Uh, I think the, it's probably important to realize uh, that the principal characteristics of Levine's field theory can be s summarized 
in, in three points. And number one is that behavior is a function of a field that exists at the time the behavior occurs. So personality is not necessarily this thing that is stable, but it's something that's dynamic in any given situation. So when we draw these models, these little pictorial pictures of personality, we aren't drawing a picture of someone's personality with a period at the end. We're drawing a, a picture of someone's personality with a comma or a semicolon at the end. They are graphical depictions of someone's momentary situation in a distinct period of time. Uh, the second is that analysis begins with the situation as a whole from which the components uh, are differentiated. So whereas in cognitive psychology, uh, behaviorism, Wundtian um, voluntarism and Titchenerian structuralism, whereas all uh, in current biological neuroscience, whereas all of these psychologies look at particular uh, aspects under the microscope, so uh, a neuron or, or a neurotransmitter, one could say, or a component or a mechanism in the brain, instead of looking at things in that specific molecular way, uh, Gestalt theory and Kurt Levine's personality theory looks things in a holistic, uh, molar way, big picture, a big picture psychology. You can't understand uh, what's happening in someone's feelings, thinking, and behaving uh, by looking at uh, a cell or looking at a molecule or looking at a, um, a neurotransmitter. Uh, you have to look at the big social, psychological dynamic that's occurring. And third, the concrete person in a concrete situation can be represented mathematically. So these 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 formulas that are used, just like in physics, you can use symbols, mathematical symbols, to illustrate spatial and temporal occurrences. And uh, Levine does this. So let's get a piece of paper and a pencil, and I'm going to talk you through the steps of creating a schematic of the structure of the personality. And again, remember, this is this schematical drawing is to understand any one given situation. It's not a schematic of an individual's overall personality. It would be a schematic to help a one to gain insight visually into their own current situation. So how could this be helpful? Well, it might be used in a therapeutic setting or in a coaching setting or in your own personal life in trying to understand all of the dynamics that are at play in a complex situation that you're dealing with at any given period of time. Could, I don't know what those issues could be. You could apply this to anything. Uh, but as we begin, we start by defining the person as a structural uh, concept, and that is to represent schematically in the drawing um, the thing that is set apart from everything else in the world. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, it's loosely defined, but it's things that aren't in the environment. It's things that are not psychological. Uh, they are things that are um, core to uh, the sense of personhood, a sense of being or existence. And we represent that by drawing a circle. And within that circle, we'll put P. And uh, everything within that circle is P, and everything or person, and everything outside of that circle is non-P or non-person. Next, we're going to draw an oval uh, or an elliptical shape draw an oval around the personality, around that P. And what we have there is called, th this boundary between the P and the outer oval is called the uh, psychological environment. So you might want to write P-E. P-E for psychological environment. And that's the total area within the ellipse and um, 
including the circle. It's this whole area is called the life space. The life space, you might want to make a note for yourself, the life space is equal to the PE, the psychological environment, and the P, the personality, or the person. And uh, you see that Levine actually did a formula called P plus E equals L. If you're following in our textbook that we're using, the Hall textbook, page 397, you'll see the schematic and you'll see the formula P plus E equals L. So the person plus the um, psychological environment equals the life space, the life space. And we're beginning to see that the, uh, the, the schematic is starting to look like a cell structure. And this is very fascinating because uh, you're going to see that it actually, the walls, these boundaries uh, between the person, this boundary that exists between person and the boundary of the psychological environment and boundaries that we're going to describe within it actually have uh, functions like a, a barrier. And for some people in some of these aspects, the barrier is impermeable. And in others, it's very permeable. It's very, it allows information to go in and out freely. Uh, and we have different uh, overall structures of personality based on how easily accessible communication or information is between different aspects of one's uh, psychological environment and their person and the ecological environment, the non-psychological. And the non-psychological is the entire space outside of uh, the, um, the PE. So you might want to draw outside of the oval uh, NP, or non-psychological. And we'll describe that as being the environment that uh, we live in. Uh, but before, before we get into that, that outer ex, uh, environment, before we can, let's look specifically at the characteristics of this psychological environment and the life space. I think it's probably important to point out two things at this point. Firstly, what we're looking at here is a theoretical model. And you'll find today, uh, when you deal with colleagues and uh, classmates and maybe uh, also your professors, um, anyone who takes an interest and thinks about these things, um, you typically find um, people who uh, really embrace theory, and then you have others who seem to be hostile towards theory and find it um, useless uh, and want to stick to what they see as objective facts or evidence and uh, not theoretical frameworks. Um, but ultimately, um, this is the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is more of an empirical uh, sticking to objective collection of facts, uh, whereas um, deductive thinking is taking a theoretical framework to organize those facts in. I'm not so sure that deduction, or let me put it this way, I'm not so sure that the theoretical is avoidable. Uh, even the idea that uh, of, uh, of discrete objective facts is eventually becomes a theoretical framework. It's a theory in itself. It's a theoretical framework in itself. Induction inevitably becomes deduction um, at some point. Um, that's one thing. Uh, I treat theory not as something real, but as something true. And we're going to describe that more when we talk about William James. Uh, but for something to be true, it doesn't necessarily have to be real. <laughs> for example, uh, the belief in certain things that aren't real have very true effects. Uh, think about a child in that little sh elf on the shelf business. That, that elf on the shelf isn't real but uh, its implications are very true. Um, any type of uh, theoretical framework does not necessarily have to have reality behind it, but it has to have functional truth. In other words, it functions, and uh, theoretically it's useful. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, when we look at this life space, this person and the person, the person as the, the core um, sense of uh, 
of being. That's where we have the ontological aspect. Ontology is the study of existence. And uh, it's something that unless you study existential phenomenology or psychodynamic theory, uh, it's something, or humanism, it's something that uh, is not very popular in academic psychology to talk about, it, that the uh, experience of existence, the study of existence, ontology. But Gestalt psychology makes room for it, uh, makes room for ontology. And that personhood is the sense of existence. Um, and uh, also phenomenology is the, the branch of psychology that looks at one's uh, holistic experience and uh, through introspection and through something called the phenomenological reduction. It's a method, a qualitative method of coming to uh, uh, understand uh, personal experience. And what we have here with this theoretical model of Levine and, and the Gestalt project is an attempt to schematize, schematize how, how can I say this word? Schematize, there it is. Schematize and even represent mathematically phenomenological principles. When we find the phenomenology outside of uh, Gestalt. This is people like Edmund Husserl and um, Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Um, there is not a mathematical application uh, in that realm. Uh, but here, Levine is attempting to use a theoretical framework that might not be real, but has truth in it. It can be useful in a pragmatic sense. And it is attempt to uh, schematically, so visually, spatially, and mathematically represent the phenomenological experience. And just to, I know this word phenomenology sounds big and bad, uh, but phenomenology is uh, just the experience of a phenomenon. It's whatever you're experiencing, that's the phenomenology. And uh, often it's something that can't be put into quantitative numbers. It's something that can be qualitatively gotten at through uh, words, and um, through drawings. So the whole of the psychological um, world, the whole of the psychological reality, uh, the totality of, of uh, what Levine calls facts, and facts are um, events. A fact is an event. It's something that, uh, a fact is something that one experiences. It's not uh, you have to shake off the the the, the uh, common use of the word fact, and he's using fact much differently. Fact is anything that it, it occurred that the individual experiences, and that that's what the psychologist studies: the collection of facts, the possible facts, and and we use these to understand behavior in the individual, and that includes everything that has to be known in the given psychological environment. So the PE. Uh, and uh, including that person, that ontological existence sense at a given time. And behavior is a function of the life space. So behavior, how one acts, is uh, an influence of the function, the dynamics of the life space, the internal, the personalized sense of existence and sense of person, and the psychological experience of this non-psychological, what's called the physical world. But it's not physical <laughs> in the common term. Physical world, anything outside of that non-psychological barrier, uh, that environment, the world we live in, it, it is physical events, but it's also non-physical events. So like going to a party would be a part of that physical world. That and it's, It just means non-psychological. Going to a party is an event. It's not... A, a psychological experience. One can have an psycho psychological experience while in the group at the party, but the party itself is not a psychological experience. Now, that, that psychological um, environment, that, that PE, the psychological environment is what we can understand this in a very Kantian way. It's the uh, experience of the non-psychological world. So we have this non-psychological world, the environment we live in, what Levine calls the physical world. And then we have our person, which would be our way, our, our thinking, our, our inner core and of being, and our sensory systems and our perceptual systems. And 
we interpret the physical world through the psychological environment. So, for example, when we're discussing things, we're not discussing the non-psychological, or when we ex discuss our experience, say we go to a movie. We go to a movie, and when we have a conversation with our friends or we write a review or read a review about a movie, what we're writing and reading about is the psychological experience of the physical, not the physical itself. <laughs> uh, so th there is a, another way of putting this. Uh, the pragmatists do it very nicely. And uh, 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 American pragmatism uh, and uh, C.S. Peirce, uh, Charles Saunders Peirce, uh, really came at something that is quite similar to what I think uh, Levine is describing here. And uh, you can look into it. It's uh, uh, the Persian Triangle. And uh, I'm going to discuss that in our lecture on um, pragmatism with William James. Uh, but it's something that if you have a moment that uh, you could pause and go look into it. But the Persian Pragmatic Triangle of... Uh, of um, of experiencing uh, what we call reality is very similar to this relationship uh, between the non-psychological or physical, the psychological environment, and uh, the person. I, I, I tend to, uh, th this, this internal word P, the nucleus of the cell here, this P, it's more of like an ontological existence. A person kind of feels like something that takes up space. Uh, and this isn't a spatial thing, it's a temporal thing. Uh, existence. Existence. So in this area of the physical world, the non-psychological, if you look at your schematic drawing, you see the P with the circle and then the, the boundary of the psychological environment with the oval. And just on the outside of that, outside of that is something that Levine refers to as the foreign hull, H-U-L-L, the foreign hull of the life space. And that is the boundaries, the boundary area where the physical and the psychological meet. And it's in this area that is of interest to the psychologist of that boundary between the uh, the psychological and the physical, the interpretation of events and the event itself. And um, that foreign hull, uh, foreign because it's outside of the person and their psychological makeup, but has uh, influence on the psychological makeup. And that's a dynamic, a complex dynamic. The foreign hull, it's the, right at the border of the physical and the psychological environments. The first step in doing an investigation of some sort of, of one's psychological uh, ecology, uh, this um, one's uh, life space and how the physical in that foreign hall the, the affects the psychological, that's called the, the psychological ecology, how that um, is affected, um, the first step is to examine what is in the foreign hull. So the foreign hull, you could think uh, this is current, or maybe right, current uh, events in one's ecology, in one's life. So whatever, whatever you're experiencing at this given moment in the physical environment, whether you're in school or in a pandemic or, or uh, you know, at a movie or at a football game or whatever it is you're doing on a date, that is the current event of your life. That is the foreign hall. And that is a, an out there physical world event that has direct influence on the life space, on the psychological environment. So this... Um, physical world or the non-psychological is very important because it has direct implications on the psychological environment of the life space. Um, the boundary between the psychological environment and the non-psychological environment, that cell wall you might want to think of it as, is, uh, has a permeability. 
And that means that the psychological can affect the non-psychological or the physical, and the physical world or the non-psychological world can affect the psychological environment. So what you think will result in actions and behaviors that uh, influence the outside world, the physical world, and things that happen, events that happen in the physical world will have impact and influence on the psychological environment. Uh, that's the life field. That's the dynamics and why we have to look at an entire ecology at any given moment, a whole psychological entire ecology to examine an individual's circumstance. So what does this mean uh, so far? It's really looking at the holistic view of things. Um, when we look at an individual, we aren't looking at a collection of personality traits. That would be too limited. Those personality traits from another theory, trait theory, which have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, Levine. I'm just using this as a comparative example. The psychological traits would be something that might be uh, uh, one aspect of a bigger picture, but those traits uh, would be uh, activated in different situations. So this is all contextual. Uh, trait theory tries to have a, a set way of being that is uh, that permeates or that stays constant through all events. But most of us don't experience life that way. Think about something as basic as introversion or extroversion. Uh, we all have moments of extroversion and moments of introversion. And some of us tend to have, can ha have more extroversion than introversion, but it usually has something to do with the, the overall bigger picture that one is in. I often find that when I'm with people who are uh, very extroverted, I tend to become more introverted. I, I, I balance, I almost feel like there's a, a balancing effect that's taking place. And when I'm with people that maybe are severely introverted, that would bring out an extroverted side of me. Not always. That's the point that uh, Gestalt that Levine is making. It's always a moment-to-moment uh, thing that is occurring, event that is occurring, and that's why we have to uh, look at not personality as a stable thing, but personality as something that exists and changes and is fluid from moment to moment. Now, if we remember, the person is represented by that nucleus, that cell, uh, that center of this system, and the psychological environment is out, lies just outside of that uh, inner P, the person. And um, we're going to look now at a closer look of that, um, that core, that nucleus, the person. And first you have to divide the person into two parts. And you can draw a, a circle uh, within the circle. Draw a circle within the P. Uh, and that you can represent that that's called the perceptual motor region, or the PM. Now, the inner, the uh, inside the P, the core of the P, is something called the IP, or the inner personal region. So the P is broken up into the absolute car, core, which is the inner personal, and then there's the outer areas called the perceptual motor. And the inner personal region is completely surrounded by the perceptual motor area so that it has no direct contact with the boundary separating the person from the environment. Uh, so in between the person and the environment, we have perceptual motor. Now, what is this perceptual motor core? Well, uh, we can think of it as sensation and, uh, and the experience of those sensations, the perception. And when those sensation and perception uh, come to be, they are interpreted and organized into the psychological environment. I think this shows us how we each can come into contact with different sensory uh, f facts in the in the world. Uh, however, they are um, filtered through our uh, our sensory or perceptual motor uh, understanding, our, our our apparatus of our uh, and our minds, our psychological minds, and that's how we can. Uh, two of us can encounter the same stimulus and have different experience of that same sim stimulus. 
That's just complicated talk for uh, our own personal likes and dislikes. In the schematic representation of the person, the, uh, the inner person, the inner person region is further divided into um, an area at the very center called central cells. That's uh, C, central cells. And the outer ring in that person, they're called peripheral cells. P, peripheral cells. And by cells, we don't uh, mean like biological cells. We mean uh, cells of, um, of, of facts or c cells of uh, discrete experience or pieces of information. Let's look a little closer at that. And uh, as you see, it does become complicated and tedious, but it's good to know about. So now we turn to the psychological environment, and we're going to describe this. Uh, facts occur in the, the, the term fact, as we said previously, Levine used this term very specifically. It meant any type of event or physical uh, occurrence in the non-psychological environment. So a fact for Levine is not only an observable thing like a chair or a football game, it is also something that may not be directly observable but can be inferred from something that is observable. In other words, there are empirical or phenomenal facts and hypothetical or dynamic facts. So uh, here's a simple example. Uh, the effect, effect of the effect, <laughs> the effect of gravity, you can't see it, but it's it, the the event of it is a fact in our lives. So anything either sense or inferred is uh, a fact for Levine. So an event, an event on the other hand, is the result of the interaction of several facts. So an event happens when several facts have uh, combined together. So uh, a chair and a person are each facts but a person s s seating him or himself on the chair is an event. And uh, with these two regions are said to be connected when a fact is in one region is in communication with a fact in another region. Uh, so, for example, the person is said to be connected with the environment because a fact in the environment can alter, modify, displace or intensify or even minimize facts within the person. And in ordinary language, the environment can change the person and the person can change the environment. So this is all kind of physics-specific language about the process of how uh, we um, phenomenologically function in the environment. Okay, so this psychological environment uh, gets divided up into regions and the regions are dependent on the facts in our experience. Now there's a correlation here. There's in phenomenology and in uh, existential psychology uh, there is a uh, also in Heideggerian ontology uh, there is the idea that we are um, not objective spatial beings in an environment, but we are space, we are temporal beings uh, that are indistinguishable from our environment. So we're being uh, as a function of our environment in a very abstract kind of way. This is what the Buddhists are talking about when they say we all are one. Uh, you might want to check out, check out the, the tale of Indra's net this idea that we experience the, uh, some kind of separateness in the world, but in actuality, uh, we are doing the world, and the world is doing us. So in other words, uh, I look out my window and I see a tree, and I can say, oh, I'm looking out at the tree, but I'm bringing that, bringing that treeness into existence. Now, that's not to say that that it there's not some sort of fact outside of my psychological environment, but the fact but my experience of tree 
and my understanding of tree. I, I learned that concept. Uh, it, it was arbitrarily, arbi, arb, how about that, arbi, arbitrary. <laughs> it's, it was arbitrarily um, uh, it developed at some point in human history. And uh, we don't come into existence knowing trees or treeness. We come in to experience the tree through education, through social convention and language. And in that way, I am doing that tree. <laughs> uh, tr the concept of tree is something that exists within the psychological environment. Well, outside of that, the real, uh, the what's really, what that thing, the physical event outside of that is beyond uh, being a tree. Tree is something we socially bring to this concept in our psychological environment. We put this in another way. When we go to a movie, we have different reactions to that movie. Some of us relate to certain characters and not to others. Some of us are defensive or sensitive or feel inspired by certain aspects and the same aspects cause disgust in other people. And, and even in ourselves, at one age we can become very moved by something and at a later age we are not moved by it. What this tells us is that uh, this thing that we commonly know as an objective world is an illusion. Uh, what we have is not an objective world. Uh, we have a participatory event that we bring to the world. The, the psychological environment, the foreign hull, combine in the life space to bring about reality. Now you see why this uh, theory uh, didn't catch on so uh, strongly in the United States when behaviorism was, uh, was so dominant in psychology. Behaviorism is, there's nothing complicated to get in behaviorism. You, it's very easy to get. Uh, this stuff is difficult to get. This is talking about the things that behaviorism refused to allow into psychology. And here we're looking at uh, dynamic structures of uh, phenomenological experience. And boy, that is, even though Levine is attempting to make this into something visual and mathematical, uh, like theoretical physics, um, it's tough to get. It's trying to describe the abstract uh, through schematics and mathematics, through formulas. Well, in that way, if you've hung in this far, good for you, and keep hanging in there. Um, as we cover this, uh, some of the information will become very important for you to make decisions in your life and to help other people make decisions in their lives. lives. Um, the, in this um, psychological environment, we have these regions, and the regions are these combination of facts that come to be uh, to us through our experience in life, through growing up and through uh, our lived experience and learning, etc., so studying and thinking and just experiencing life. Our psychological environment becomes this complex system of regions. And you can see on page 400 in the Hall textbook, you can see these uh, geometric regions that are set up. And each of those regions are some sort of event in life that made some sort of impact on us that, that, uh, uh, that it helps us to, that, that allows us or shapes the world we live in, our experience of the world. And that's why we all experience the world differently. And um, those regions have boundaries, and these boundaries are either uh, either very thin or permeable or non-permeable, and that's how, uh, you know, some people make a lot of connections between things, and other people see very distinct differences between two things, and this could be, I guess, in, uh, in psychology seen as like a rigid personality versus a more fluid personality. A rigid personality is someone who uh, likes categories, likes distinction of different things into their neat little categories, and someone who is more interested in fluidity is more wavy, <laughs> less geometrical and more wavy. They're more interested in seeing connections between things rather than distinctions. Well, theoretically represented, we have these 
regions in the psychological environment, these different events. And if there's a very rigid um, boundary between these um, these regions, then we have a certain rigidity of experience in life. We don't see connections between things. We see things very uh, structured or very differentiated. And this is called the firmness weakness dimension. A very thick line represents an impermeable boundary. Um, and this is a resistance to integrating different regions. And another way of representing the interconnection between regions is to take into account the nature of the medium of a region. The medium of a region is its surface quality. And Levine uh, distinguishes several, several properties of, uh, of the, this medium of the region, the character of a given region or understanding of the world. Again, this is a very abstract way of thinking about things, and it feels and smells and tastes like theoretical physics, the most important of which is the fluidity, rigidity dimension. A fluid medium is one that responds quickly to any influence brought to it, and uh, a flexible it's flexible and pliant. A rigid medium resists change. It is stiff and inelastic. So two regions that are separated from each other uh, by an extremely rigid boundary, will not communicate with each other. So this is like having different experiences in life, but not not experiencing them as something that is um, uh, understandable in a bigger whole as b being um, related to one another. And we see this again in personality. Um by utilizing the concepts of nearness and remoteness, firmness, weakness, and fluidity and rigidity. So in other words, these regions are either touching or they're far apart. That could affect how they communicate, uh, nearness and remoteness. Or they're firm and weakness within the, the firmness or weakness. This might be the conviction of that, that region itself. Or the, 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 the other characteristic, rigidity and fluidity of the boundary between regions. These all affect the overall structure of the personality. Now I'm going to take a moment and explain something to you uh, in a way that's not theoretical, but very practical. We go through life and we have different experiences and those experiences become part of our psychological makeup. In other words, our worldview. The Germans called this a Weltanschauung in dynamic and uh, uh, phenomenological psychology, the Weltanschauung, world view. And this structures how we come to experience ourselves and others and events in the world. Now this is the life space, this, this Weltanschauung. It's this life space. It's the psychological environment. And each of those experiences can be either strong or weak experiences. And the strong experiences stay they have great influence on us, and the weak experiences have influence, but not as much. And these experiences can be structured so that we see similarities between certain experiences and other experiences we don't see similarities. This would be the idea of nearness or remoteness. So two experiences that resonate with us would be regions that are close, would be represented schematically as regions that are closer together. Um, a, and then finally, the, the boundaries between regions can either be thick or thin. That's the idea of um, fluidity or rigidity. And so we can live in, an, we can have all these experiences, and we can have a very kind of flexible, fluid existence where we see connections between things. We could have some uh, complex arrangement of uh differentiated experiences. And this is what we view in ourselves and others as this thing called the personality structure. So as personality changes, in other words, as our experiences uh, change in life, the structure of this life field changes. And that includes the fact that some boundaries become perme more permeable and others rigidify, all based on our experiences. Think of something like post-traumatic stress disorder and how the experiences of the physical world 
uh, have implications for the structure of the psychological world and how that then will be carried over into the next situation. And uh, the more forceful, the more uh, the, the the stronger the the uh, event, uh, the more implications there will be for the psychological makeup in the life field. So within each of these regions of the psychological environment and the person, the interpersonal region and the perceptual motor region, there are facts. Each of these. Uh, facts in a given region uh, are experienced as needs, uh, then that's when they're in, um, in the principal facts of the interpersonal uh, core are called needs, but the, um, the facts of the psychological environment are called valences. And each need occupies a separate cell in the interpersonal region, and each valence occupies a separate region in the psychological environment. So let's look at this idea of uh, needs and valences and how they affect what we call personality or experience of the world. Sometimes we're sitting in the classroom or maybe you're sitting in your study listening to this lecture right now, but we psychologically go someplace else. I remember sitting in the cl in the classroom in high school and not finding what was being discussed very interesting. I was in an entirely different world in my mind. And that's an example of how these facts, these regions, these factual regions that exist in the psychological environment and also in the person interpersonal environment, how they can reorganize themselves and restructure themselves. So therefore Keep in mind, when you're sitting in the classroom and you're really uh, perceptually organized towards, intentionally organized towards that physical environment, you're actually a quite different person than uh, if you were perceptually organized towards some intended, towards some uh, fantasy, some uh, other psychological reorganization. This, These regions can reorganize themselves within the psychological environment. And that center P can shift of where it's located within that region. So it's very dynamic, a very dynamic system that's constantly in flux, definitely not a, a stable uh, idea of a personality, but really a plurality of, of personalities that exist at any given moment. The way that... Uh, person circle shifts within the psychological environment might be, oh, I don't know, Some an example could be uh, if you're in the class and uh, you're attending towards the teacher, that person core is, uh, is in a position that's very close to the region of whatever's happening in, uh, with that classroom experience. But if uh, the guy or girl next to you passes a note to you, and suddenly that shifts to a different region, and that different region becomes uh, more important, more the center of intentional focus uh, in the psychological environment. In part two, we're going to turn towards what's known as vector psychology. So we're going to make a shift from the structure of the personality, which is the life field, the person, the psychological environment, and the um, non-psychological physical world, the foreign hull, uh, we're going to make a shift from that structure of the dynamic structure of personality to vector psychology, which is how uh, one person moves uh, within the uh, within the world. This is like maybe the psychological study of willful activity. Uh, in the most simplistic way, we're going to take a look at how the individual structure in its life field, in its vector, um, moves from an intention, from a goal-directed activity, a need or a desire towards a goal to satisfy that need or desire, and how it navigates the various obstacles within the life field. And that will be in part two of our study of Gestalt, Kurt Levine's Gestalt Theory of Personality. 
Hi, this is Dr. Joby. Welcome to part two of our discussion of Kurt Levine's Gestalt Field Theory of Personality. In lecture one, or in the first part of this lecture, we uh, looked at the structure of the personality, the field theory, life field, uh, how Levine described uh, personality as a, a dynamic process rather than a molecular stable entity. And today we're going to discuss the dynamics of personality. So this is called vector psychology. And um, this is how we understand uh, maybe willful decision-making processes in the individual. Much of what uh, Levine describes is um, a conflict between uh, organism and the ecology, the environment the organism's in, whether that's physical or social environment. So, uh, for example, behavior is always goal-directed. It's always intentional. There's some desire, and it's usually uh, noted by... Levine notes that it's usually the case that behavior is aimed towards reducing tension uh, to, to satisfaction or to a sense of uh, non-tension. And he describes three um, conflicts that we, that we can describe all of life's conflicts in, and those are approach-approach uh, conflict and avoidance-avoidance conflict and approach-avoidance conflict. So in an a uh, an approach approach conflict occurs when a person is attracted to two goals at the same time, such as needing to choose from two movies you want to see at the same cinema or between two excellent graduate schools after being ex uh, accepted at both. So this is a conflict. There is a barrier. You can't go to both graduate schools. <laughs> I I remember being in this very situation. An approach-approach approach conflict in my life out of undergrad was when I was accepted at, uh, at Columbia University's graduate program and also at the New School for Social Research, where uh, Max Wertheimer started the psychology program. And uh, I was really in... This was a, an approach-approach approach conflict for me. I, I liked the idea of what was taught at Columbia, and going to Columbia, and I also had a strong affinity towards the spirit of the New School, the zeitgeist of the New School. And so I had to, uh, the barrier was I couldn't go to both programs. Um, and that was an approach approach conflict. So, um, well, incidentally, I called both schools to find out more information and. Um, the uh, people who answered the phone at Columbia seemed completely clueless. <laughs> they, they couldn't answer any of my questions about the program, and, and they didn't really seem interested in discussing the program or answering my questions. And so I hung up the phone, and I called the new school, and the person that I spoke with there was wonderful, and they told me everything I needed to know, and... Uh, and it was they were they made me feel like they were really on the ball, and so I decided to go to the new school. Well, at any rate, that's an approach approach conflict. The avoidance avoidance conflict is not as fun as the approach approach conflict. The avoidance avoidance conflict occurs when a person is repelled by two unattractive goals at the same time, such as when one must get a job or not have enough money, or study for an examination, or get a bad grade. So, you, you, you know, when you have to get a job, um, you, you say, oh, I don't want to go to work, but I need the money. And this is, no matter what you do, you're going to have to go to work. So that's an avoidance-avoidance conflict. Uh, Levine didn't mention this, but I will mention this to you. You can, if you're creative enough, you can turn an avoidance-avoidance conflict into an approach-approach conflict. And how do you do this? Well, you do this by, um, let's take, for example, f finding a job. 
uh, if you have to go to work someplace to, to make some money, but you're doing something that you absolutely love and you can't wait to do, maybe even something you'd do if you weren't getting paid for it, my goodness, then you have transferred this avoidance-avoidance situation into an approach-approach. You're, you're making your living and you're doing uh, something that you love. It's like that old saying, if you love what you do, you won't work a day in your life. So the avoidance-avoidance conflict occurs when a person is, uh, has a decision to make that both options are something they don't want to, <laughs> they don't want to encounter. And finally, an approach avoidance conflict. Uh, an approach avoidance conflict is often the most difficult to resolve because it involves only one goal about which one has mixed feelings, such as when having a steak is an appealing idea, but it is the most expensive item on the, the menu. So w we might call approach avoidance conflict the conflict of ambivalence, a love-hate relationship. So these are the three conflicts that um, that Levine describes he said we can we can fit all of the things that decisions we have to make we can fit into one of these three categories now the vector psychology it is a, is an examination of the personality field function the vector function of those three conflicts so the structural, representation of the life space. That is the uh, schematic that we're drawing. It's like a roadmap. A roadmap contains all the information you need to know uh, to plan whatever movements you're making to get from one place to another. And, um, and a good schematic is like a roadmap that can help you to understand how to navigate your life situation. So the map doesn't tell you where to go, and it even doesn't even tell you why you're going there. It shows you ways to get there. To actually describe how behavior takes place, in other words, what decisions are possible within a given uh, field, life field, Levine enters some dynam dynamic concepts into the conversation. And those concepts are energy, tension, need, valence, and force, and vector. And uh, let's take a look at each of those. Energy it refers to psychic energy. And um, when I use the word psychic, you might want to think psychical. Uh, psychic um, uh, energy is emotional energy. It's uh, psychological energy. And um, Levine, like other theorists of personality of, of this time, uh, saw the energy system as a closed system. And that system could, our, our state of, um, we might today call this anxiety or manic on, on one end and maybe depression on the other end and just uh, contentedness uh, when there's not a disequilibrium. So we're seeking to go from a, a state of, of tension to a state of, of um, equilibrium. And he refers to this state as disequilibrium. And that disequilibrium can either be caused by something in the physical environment, out in the ecological uh, field, um, or it could be some sort of uh, internal conflict that's occurring, some sort of emotional aspect of the inner person and um, or or of the the psychological environment and this causes a sense of disequilibrium and we we have this energy and now tension is a state of the person is a state of an inner personal re region relative to another interpersonal region so when Levine referred to dynamic processes of a region or a cell of the interpersonal sphere, he called it a system. So when there's um, maybe, you know, Leon Festinger described this as um, cognitive dissonance. When two internal um, regions of a system are in disagreement or in conflict, this is uh, tension exists. And this again 
could uh, could be um, the 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 goal directed behavior uh, the goal directed intention of behavior to get to a state of non tension. Um, the psychological means by which tension becomes equalized is called the process. And uh, a process may be thinking, remembering, feeling, perceiving, acting. Uh, so a person who is faced with the task of solving a problem becomes tense in one of his or her systems. And in order to solve the problem and thereby reduce tension, uh, he or she engages in the process of thinking. Now, thinking continues until a satisfactory solution is found, at which time the person returns to a state of equilibrium. Um, I think it's important to, to point out uh, an example of this Often when we're studying, say, things in psychology or when we're doing uh, psychotherapy and we're talking about maybe analysis of a dream or analysis of an individual's situation in life, uh, we're given different explanations and somehow we, we get a sense, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're tuned into this, we can either get a sense of being satisfied or unsatisfied with certain answers certain explanations, even in your college work. Some things you're told to be the way things are uh, or the, the, the reason for different phenomenons in, in, in your studies. And you can accept that, but you might not fully believe it, but you maybe say, well, they know more than I do. Um, this is the tension that exists when you're, you're getting a gut feeling that something's not adding up. And you, you know, Carl Jung and Levine, of course, the Gestaltists would tell us, look into that. <laughs> when trust your own gut feeling. If something doesn't feel convincing to you, there's some sort of interpersonal tension between regions occurring. And um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't just, um, it doesn't mean you should completely reject what another person or another uh, outside authority is saying. But it means you shouldn't dismiss what you are feeling either. You should recognize that tension between the, the regions. So that's an example of the, this inner tension. Um, an increase in tension uh, or the release of energy in an interpersonal region is caused by the arousal of the need. A need may be a physiological condition such as hunger, thirst, or sex, or it may be a desire for something such as a job or a spouse. It could be an intention to do something, such as completing a task or keeping an appointment. A need is therefore a motivational concept and is equivalent to such terms as motive, wish, drive, and urge. So here we have energy, the complete system, tension, and the tension is something that is within the state of an interpersonal relationship, in the interpersonal regions, some kind of disagreement between two regions, in the interpersonal realm of person, and tension is initiated by a need. A need is some sort of uh, goal-directed behavior, a wish or a desire. Now, L Levine also spoke about needs and quasi-needs, and a need is due to some inner state, such as hunger uh, or sexual desire, while a quasi-need is equivalent to a specific intention like satisfying one's hunger with a cheeseburger or, or uh, you know, some sexual desire directed towards a certain specific individual. So quasi-needs are uh, the objects that are become the, the fixation of our uh, desire to, of our needs. Now, within the regions of the psychological environment, the person has different value placed on those regions. And those values can either be positive or negative value. And that value is what's referred to as the valence. Um, and of course, we can be repelled or attracted. Uh, negative valences repel us. We're repelled from negative valences and positive valences attract us. So within the regions of the psychological environment, um, the presence or absence of the object, so the quasi-need, the, the object, the, the, the desired object to satisfy the, the need uh, can affect things whether or not it's in the physical environment.
its availability and its proximity um, to other objects can be experienced, the valence can be experienced as either weak, medium, or strong. And uh, the strength of a valence depends upon the strength of the need plus all the non-psychological factors that we've been discussing. So now we have all the theoretical ideas here uh, that precede locomotion or a willful action towards the uh, external physical environment. And we can draw a topological representation of any given conflict, any situation. Um, and you can start this by drawing the life field on your piece of paper. So draw an oval life field. And within that, um, you can divide the, the oval in half with a barrier right down the middle and place your person nucleus on the left side. If you're following on the textbook, the Hall textbook, you can look on page 408 for this. So let's say a child has to enter a store to buy candy. Uh, and this situation can be represented um, with this figure of the life field, a boundary, and the person. Uh, but the child does not have any money. So the boundary between the child and the candy, the goal, you can put a little plus sign and a line uh, with an arrow going towards the plus sign. You see the barrier, there's an impassable barrier. The child will move as close to the candy as possible, even putting their nose against the window, but without them being able to reach for it. They say, if they, and then the psychological environment starts to develop. If I had money, I could buy the candy. Maybe mom will give me some money. So in other words, a new, uh, uh, a secondary conflict arises. So the primary conflict is to get the candy. And then you have, it develops into a, a, a complex of conflicts because now it's a matter of money and maybe manipulating mom or getting mom or dad to get the money, etc. And this uh, structure comes to develop. If you, if you um, then put a barrier, a second barrier up and put maybe parent on the top and money on the bottom, now we see a more complex situation. What seemed to be just the desire to get candy is actually now a desire to get money to get candy, to manipulate the parent to get the candy, or let me manipulate the parent to get the money, now, etc. So these all can have, all these barriers can either be um, strong or weak. So you can have strong or weak barriers. So maybe the parent barrier is very strong. That means the parent that the child's dealing with is not one who's going to give in. And so that is avoided. That option is avoided. And now the, the um, motivation might go more towards money. So this would be towards getting the money from another source other than the parent. And in this very simple understanding, we can draw a graphical analysis. If the mother refuses to give the child any money, she may think of borrowing it from a friend. In this case, the region containing the mother is surrounded by a very thick, impenetrable boundary. Uh, and the new path for the region uh, will go through a friend. And the friend it, it becomes a new momentary schematic in this uh, vector analysis. So in the vector psychology and the topology of any given situation, you can draw a graphical understanding of your situation by taking into consideration all of the theoretical concepts of how these pressures in regions interact in the life field. And if you have a problem, let's say uh, writing your essay, or how about this problem, writing your essay for this very assignment for this uh, section of our personality psychology course. You may want to draw your life field. And now your goal, put a goal here, is the essay, the assignment that you will have written here. And what are the barriers? Let's oh, put your P, your P with the circle on the left-hand side with an arrow, the desire, the intention, the desire is to go towards that essay. Now everyone has a different structure of regions in their person and in their psychological environment. And you are right now in this 
uh, physical environment, online class, a physical environment, and you have an essay to write. And your essay is going to be uh, to actually put this into use, take a conflict that you are a de a dealing with and identify what which of the three conflicts it is, and, um, and then to draw a schematic of all of the obstacles and different uh, levels of barriers that these obstacles pose to help you understand a path to getting towards uh, the completion of this assignment. So what's number one barrier? Well, the number one barrier is a knowledge barrier. And that knowledge barrier means you can't fake it. <laughs> you have to listen to the lectures and study this stuff, and it's very difficult. So that first barrier is learning the material, learning the theory. Uh, another barrier towards uh, the essay is maybe your belief in your ability to, to do this. So we'll put another barrier up here. Uh, maybe time is a barrier. So we start to list these within the life field. How about uh, learning the material is a barrier to writing your essay? Time is a barrier to writing your essay? Belief in yourself. Uh, now, here's the interesting. Here's an interesting thing to consider. You know this valence for this need. This need valence. You need to write the essay, but that doesn't mean you want to write the essay. Imagine that, that uh, this was an ice cream cone at the other end. You'd want the intention would be to want to eat that, but this is a different type of motivation. So um, this might be. Uh, a, a, a conflict that is avoidance avoidance <laughs> and you don't want to write the essay you don't want to read the material and that's good to know to, to identify what it is exactly that to have a better understanding of what you're dealing with so maybe learning the material seems difficult but that's manageable and time is an issue and belief in self and you begin to list these reasons, these barriers that will get to that that are keeping you from getting to completing your goal. And you can uh, maybe say, well, time is fixed. There's nothing you're going to do about that. The time is set. Due dates, that you know, our due dates are set. So there's a real thick boundary around the due date, the time. Uh, belief in self and learning. Well, learning might be uh, the thing that is. Uh, the least thick boundary. You just have to start and you already have. And belief in self, boy, that, to believe in yourself that you have the ability to learn how to do this. And you might be able to make a topolo topological scheme here that would go and address belief in self and move into learning. So maybe first you have to say to yourself, I can do this. I am smart enough to understand this. And maybe I don't have to be an expert on it and understand every little nuance that Dr. Joby described or that the textbook explains. But the general understanding of how this topological schematic works, I get. And I can do my best. And then you go through the learning. And then you start writing. And, uh, and then your essay is finished. OK, that is Kurt Levine and his vector psychology. Gestalt, field theory of personality.